So with the basics of MPI under control, let's take a look at some of the more advanced features that MPI offers us for distributed memory parallel programming. First thing we're going to talk about is the ability to do simultaneous sends and receives. We saw in the previous you know, basics information that we can send to an arbitrary process and receive from an arbitrary process, but we need to, um, we need to make sure that we uh, coordinate those activities and that can get complex when we're trying to send and receive a lot of different things to a lot of different places. So simultaneous send receive uh, makes a that a little bit simpler. Unfortunately it does that by giving us a really elaborate function call that we use to do these transmissions. And I've kind of grouped these arguments together to indicate their their relationship. The first group has to do with the buffer that we're going to send to some other process. So just like with the standard send call, we have a send buffer pointer that refers to the first byte of that information, the number of elements that are being sent, and then the data type that we're, that we're going to send. So if we've got an array of integers, we're going to use MPI int there. We give the destination uh, rank of the processor we're, se process we're sending to, and then the tag that we want to send. And then there's a similar set of arguments on the receive side. So we need to allocate space for a buffer that's going to be used to receive the information from another rank. We have to say how many elements are available, what the data type of those elements are, and then where are we going to get the uh, message from and what is the tag that we're expecting. And then as before, we have the communicator that we're going to use to communicate around. So MPI COM world would be a common one there. And then also the status, which corresponds to the receive status, basically. We're going to do what amounts to the same kind of operation as what we saw for MPI send. And in order to figure out what happened as a result of that send, we want to have that status argument as well. As an example of the use of this function, here's a re-implementation re of that kind of round-robin send-receive pattern that we saw before, except now we're using MPI send-receive. So same basic infrastructure code that generates a random number that uh, that is going to be sent by each process. That's what's stored here in rand mine. Uh, and then the um, other thing that we're going to allocate as a space to store the information from the random number of the previous processor in this ring mapping that we've done. So the uh, the arguments are pretty straightforward. It, um, we're going to say where do we find the information that we're sending. Remember these first few arguments are the send information. So we're going to send from that address a single value of type long and we're going to send it to the next rank in the, in the series and we're just going to use a tag of one. At the same time, we're also going to be receiving, but from the previous rank. Uh, and so we've allocated this space to store that value. It's one MPI long value uh, long. And then we're also going to receive on tag number one. And we tell it to just use MPI com world, and we have to pass a value for that status argument uh, and a, the address of one of those status structures that can be filled in for us by the send receive function. And then uh, what I'm doing here at the end basically is just saying I'm, I'm rank percent %d, uh, I had mine value, uh, and then the previous processor rank had this value. And so the output we get for p equals 4 uh, is shown here and we can see basically the same pattern. So for example, um, processor number 3 wakes up, it decides that its random number is 12, and then later on we can see I had 12, uh, and that 2, which is where it received from, had 26, and we can see a little earlier here that process 2 had a value of 26. So the tracks all kind of line up here just as they did before. You can see that this is a whole lot simpler than trying to orchestrate this specific collection of sends and receives. Uh, so oftentimes, although send receive seems a little daunting because it's got so many arguments, uh, it turns out to be quite a lot more convenient. Next thing I'd like to talk about is collective communication. This is basically the ability to broadcast information to more than one other process. Uh, and in particular, we're going to talk about broadcasting to all the other processes in the multi-computer. Uh, before I get to that, though, I want to show you a little trick that I use quite regularly uh, to help improve the debugging output that comes out of my implementations. So I've defined a new function here called, just called debug, and the first argument that it takes is going to be the rank. And of course, we always want to print out the rank of the uh, of the process that that we're getting information from. And then the rest of this is actually going to kind of work like a printf statement. And this might be some new syntax to you if you've not used the what's called the var args or variable argument syntax in C. 
So we, we're saying here basically we're going to pass in a rank, and then we're going to pass in a format string, which is going to be used basically to invoke uh, the underlying printf mechanism. And then the dot, dot, dot here basically tells C, hey, there's going to be some variable number of arguments following that format string, which makes sense because if you think about just an ordinary printf, you might have, you know, percent %d, percent %d, percent %f, or something like that. Uh, to indicate two integers and a floating point value, and then you've got to supply two integers and a floating point value as the additional arguments to printf. So we're already familiar with the use of variable number of arguments in C from our use of the printf function, but we may not have seen the implementation of that. So this is how you can, can do that. And what I'm going to do basically is just kind of use this underlying variable argument list mechanism and then add a little bit of additional decoration to it so that I can get some useful debugging output. So the first thing to declare is this uh, thing called args. It can be called whatever you want, but that's a pretty typical example. And this is going to be of type VA list. So that's variable argument list. And that comes from a standard C library header file. Um, and that's what's going to be used basically for us to be able to access the, the variable arguments. What we've got to do then uh, is invoke this function VA start. And what we do is we pass in a, we pass in that args value, and then we also pass in the last argument of the function prior to the dot, dot, dot. That basically just tells the underlying stack mechanism how to go find these arguments that are being passed on the stack that we don't know how many of them there are. Um, what we're going to do eventually with that is call this variation of the printf function vprintf. And this suddenly looks a lot more like a printf statement where we have a format string and we have this list of arguments. So the, the arguments that follow the format here are going to be passed into this v, v version of printf, and that's going to act just like an ordinary printf. Now in addition to that, I'm going to do a printf, and I want to output two things, the rank for sure, as well as the current time from a nanosecond scale timer. So this is just an ordinary printf statement. I've given a format string that says uh, print out a floating point value, a vertical bar, my rank number, another vertical bar. And then whatever is being passed into this debug function as if it was a normal printf. And we'll see the output from this uh, th throughout the rest of this talk. Uh, then the at the end here, we're going to, oh, notice also that I did not include any kind of new line terminator here. Uh, so this timestamp and rank number are going to appear on the same line as whatever comes out of this printf statement. And then finally, we need to let the C library clean things up with respect to this variable list of arguments, so we call VA end. So this is all just kind of boilerplate, declaring the arguments, doing the start, doing the end, and then inside of the, or between the start and the end, you can access these arguments in different ways. So super helpful little debugging function um, that you might want to define in a, you know, a helper file some place so you can access it uh, later in your in your algorithms. Okay, so let's return to the idea of collective communication. Uh, there's two things we want to talk about. One is, let me start with the second one first here, MPI Bcast, which is short for broadcast. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that we're going to, t one, one process wants to be able to send values to all of the other processes in the multi-computer. So just like with all the cases where we want to communicate something, we're going to have three arguments that specify where the information we want to communicate lives in memory, how many elements are stored there, and what is the type of each of those elements. So if we wanted to store, so if we wanted to send a single integer, we could do that. If we wanted to send uh, a million floating point values, we could do that and send it to all the other processors in the multi-computer. Uh, there's a communicator, of course, as the last parameter like usual. And the interesting argument here is this argument called source. Now, what we're going to see is that every processor, every process in the multi-computer is going to is going to set, set that source value to be the same value. So we might say if we you know we have eight processors or processes, let's just imagine that process three is known to be the one that's going to send out this broadcast value. All eight processors are going to call MPI broadcast, and they're all going to say number three source source equals to th equal to three. On the processor that actually has the rank three, under the hood, it's going to send to everybody else. On all the other processes that can check to see that they are not rank three, they're going to set up to receive. 
Now, it might seem a little, seem a little strange that we have a special purpose function for this. Uh, you know, why couldn't we just go ahead and implement that with a send and a bunch of receives or something like that? Well, it turns out that this is more than just kind of a kind of syntactic sugaring because there are multi-computers that have specific support in the hardware and in the network for broadcasting values to all of the all of the uh, processes in the multi-computer and under the hood the idea here is that this function in MPI could be implemented to take advantage of that capability on those machines that support it and then there's always going to be kind of a fallback implementation that will under the hood basically just use the ordinary send and receive mechanisms but it's up to the implementation of MPI to take care of those details as opposed to us having to worry about that for different architectures. So that's really the, the, the collective communication idea. We can broadcast stuff out to a bunch of different a bunch of different places. Now the other case here, this MPI barrier isn't really sending any specific message or any specific information, but it's still a kind of a com collective communication step in the following sense. When you call MPI barrier, your process is basically going to be blocked until every other process calls MPI barrier. So it's kind of a way to have all the processes rendezvous at the same exact spot in the code, such that when they get there, they call MPI barrier, and then they're just going to wait until everybody else arrives. And when that final process calls MPI barrier so that everybody has called it now, then everybody is released to continue processing. Again, this is something that we could probably implement ourselves, but it turns out that there are also multi-computers that have specific support for these kinds of barrier operations. It's often an additional signal wire that's connecting together all of the processors on this one line, and when they all assert that line together, then the processors can recognize that everybody's reached the barrier and then can continue executing. Let's take a look at the two of these functions in actual use. So first of all, here's our main function. And again, this is just kind of typical boilerplate for an MPI program. We want to know how many processes we have. We want to know what our rank is. We have to call MPI init to get started. We have to call MPI finalize to shut things down properly. And we're still going to fish out our specific values for the total number of processors and our rank. Um, there's a call here to start timer. That's actually one of the helper functions behind that debug var args thing that I showed you so that we can actually include the appropriate timestamp for each of the lines of output. And here's an invocation of that debug. We're going to say debug. We've got to pass it the rank. And then here's an ordinary printf style format string that includes a percent %d, right, which is going to look for a, an additional argument and print that out as an integer. And what it's going to print out is numprox. There's another one here at the end still needs to get the rank, and in this case we're just printing goodbye without any additional arguments, and there's no format characters with the percent sign inside that string, so we're good to go. Notice also that these end with a new line uh, so that they advance to the next line in the output. Okay, the interesting part here is the invocation of these two these two other functions. So the first thing I'm going to show you how, how, to, how to make it work is the broadcast, and I'm going to send in a rank the current rank of the processor and the total number of processors, and we'll see how that works in a second. Broadcast is going to return some random value, and that random value is going to be then used to invoke this other function called barrier. So let's take a look at the implementation of these two things and the output that we get from them. So first of all, the broadcast function. So I'm just showing the, uh, the body of this function so that it all fits on this slide. We're going to create a random value here, and you might be wondering why I'm so focused on random values in these algorithms. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that the information that gets passed around between the processes in the distributed memory multi-computer are, uh, are, are generated on the fly. It's not something that's fixed in the code. Um, you know, it'd be easy for me to just pass around the same value or, or pretend to pass around the same value and not actually do it. But if I'm creating a random value and then sending it, broadcasting it in this case to other processes, those other processes can also output that value and just verify that they are receiving that random value. Um, I also need to pick a particular processor that's going to be the one that's going to do the broadcast. And arbitrarily here, I've chosen to just take the number of processors minus one and use that as the rank of the processor that's going to do the broadcast. Um, and in many cases, if you need kind of the, you know, sort of a default process to do these types of operations, and it doesn't matter who does it, 
uh, you'll often fall back on just using processor zero or process with rank zero, but there's no comp particular compelling reason to do that. The process zero isn't special or anything like that, uh, so it's often convenient to do that. But just to illustrate that you don't have to, I've chosen to use the process with the highest numbered rank, basically. Um, so what I'm going to do here then is if I am that broadcaster rank, right, if I am that process, then it's going to be up to me to come up with a random value that I'm going to broadcast to everybody else. So I'm going to seed the, the random number generator. And this is kind of important here. Um, each of the processes is going to execute this, uh, this function. Um, well, in general, if you're going to seed a random number generator, each process is going to have to use that random number generator. Uh, what it's, what's helpful here is to seed it differently for each of the processors. So I generally use a time value or timestamp so that it runs different each time that I execute the program. But I'm also adding to that time value the rank of the processor. And that's usually sufficient to sort of force each of the processes to have a different seed so that when you start asking for random numbers, they're going to be different across all the processes. If you don't do that, if you just were to seed the random value with the same constant, for example, then all of the random number generators on all the processes would essentially be synchronized with each other and they'd generate the same sequence of pseudo random values, which generally is not what we're interested in. So uh, we seed it differently on each process. In this case, it doesn't really matter because only one process is generating that random number. But then I call random and I'm going to limit this to be a value between 0 and 10. So that's the, f the fresh value that I've created that I want to broadcast to the other processes. And I'm going to print out a little message that says I'm broadcasting this value so that we can verify that it was received on the other processes in the multi-computer. So here's our MPIB cast. I'm sending that random value. It's one long valued uh, 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 bu buffer content. And I'm passing the broadcaster rank, okay? Now, notice that when I calculate that broadcaster rank up here, that's gonna be exactly the same on every process in the multi-computer. Uh, they're all gonna know how many processes they were started with because we asked for that back here in the main function, they're all going to get the same value there. And so they're all going to calculate the same value as the rank of the broadcaster. And again, they all pass that rank to the broadcast function. And in the implementation of that, the broadcast function again will figure out, am I that, am I that process with that rank? If so, then I'm sending, otherwise I'm receiving. And then uh, finally, if the rank is not the broadcaster rank, in other words, I'm on the receiving end of this, of this broadcast, then I'm going to also do some debugging and print out the value that I received. And then I'm also going to send that random value back to the, to the main function for use in the next step. So let's look at the output. We can see here that process 3 wakes up, says hello, and then it prints out that it's broadcasting 2. Right, so the random number that it generated was 2 in this case. And then the other processes all fire up. And then at various intervals in the f in it going forward, they indicate that they have received the value 2. So that was the random number that we generated. And here again, we're verifying that that information got communicated properly to all the other processes in the multi-computer. So next, let me go back to the main function here. So that, that takes care of the call to the broadcast function. Now I'm going to call this barrier function. And it's going to get the random value that was generated by the, the broadcast function. Again, just because I want to use an arbitrary value to illustrate how things are working under the hood in different processes. So let's skip forward to that barrier function. So it gets the rank and that random value. Now, what I said before was uh, when a barrier is encountered, and that's taking place right here. When that barrier is encountered, the process that calls that function will not return from that function until every other process has called that function. So for example, if, if a process is going along, computing just fine, and it hits the barrier function, it's going to sit there until such time as if, there, if there's only two processes executing and the other one continues going along and then it, hit, it hits its barrier function. At that point, then both of the processes that are in this two-process multi-computer are going to be able to continue operating and they'll continue moving forward. But it's not until everybody calls that. 
Now, in order to illustrate that idea in, pre in, in, in operation, what I want to do is use the sleep function. So this is a standard built-in C library thing that sleeps the process, basically just stops it from executing for some number of seconds. And what I'm doing is I'm taking that random value that I got in, and I'm adding to that twice the rank of the processor. So each of the processes is going gonna, is gonna to sleep a different amount of time. And when they're when they when they're about to go to sleep, they're going to say, "How long am I going to go be sleeping?" And then they're going to sleep, and then they're going to wake up again, and then they're going to try to enter the barrier. So it'll print this little debugging output, and here's where we call the actual barrier. Notice that there's no rank parameter or anything like that being passed to MPI barrier because every process is going to participate. And when it leaves the barrier, it's going to print this additional output that says it left the barrier. So calculate a value to uh, a random value to sleep based on your rank number, so it's different for everybody, then sleep, then do the barrier. So here's what the output looks like. So we've got the th four processes here. Process three is sleeping eight seconds, four seconds, two seconds, six seconds. So that, that happens pretty much all right away. Um, at that point then, those processes go to sleep. Well, because process zero is only sleeping two seconds, it's uh, not surprisingly, the first to wake up. About two seconds later, process zero enters the barrier. And then we don't hear from process zero for a while, but after four seconds, process one enters the barrier. Six seconds, process two enters. Eight seconds, process three enters. At this point then, all of the processors, processes in the multi-computer have entered the barrier. And that's the point at which the barrier function will let it let everybody continue execution. So we right away see within a few milliseconds of each other uh, at, at the eight second mark here, everybody leaves the barrier and then goes back to the main function and exits the, the program. So um, that hopefully that gives you a good il illustration of how these barriers work. It's just a point where you can kind of synchronize everybody together. And again, it's called collective communication, not so much because we're giving specific information other than the fact that everybody now knows that all the other processes in the multi-computer have reached that point and continue to execute after that. Next on our list of more advanced topics is the idea of non-blocking communication. In the, uh, the send and receive that we've been seeing so far, what happens when you do a send is that the send function, the MPI send function gets invoked and it's not going to return back to you until that send has actually been completed, until it's confirmed that the information that you had in the buffer that you're trying to send out has actually been transmitted and received successfully at the far end, and then send returns. Now, that's fine. However, it's definitely a source of overhead, right? We know that anything that we do that we wouldn't normally do in a sequential implementation of an algorithm counts as parallel overhead it reduces speed up, it reduces efficiency. So we'd like to avoid those sources of parallel overhead if we can. The non-blocking form of these communication operations basically tees up the communication and then it goes off on its own. You could think of it as running in its own thread or whatever. Uh, it, it's gonna now take care of that communication operation and you can go back about your business. So if you've got a bunch of computation to do on each process in your multi-computer and you periodically need to send information to other processors and receive information from other processors, you can, for the most part, keep doing that long-running computation and then only uh, take a very short amount of time to kick off a communication, uh, whether you're sending something or receiving something. And at some later point, you're going to be able to detect that you received or sent completely that particular, uh, that particular thing. So, um, the, the bottom line is that we can allow computation to proceed concurrently with both sending and receiving. We don't have to call MPI send and then wait, or call MPI receive and then wait. We can call the, uh, the, um, the non-blocking version of those functions and then return right away back to our program to keep computing. So, uh, for the case of a non-blocking send, when we call that function in MPI, we're going to start the send operation and we're going to return before the data have been basically copied out of the buffer that we gave to the non-blocking send uh, and we can continue to go back about our business. Now that's important though to recognize that that, that function comes back before the data gets sent. We got to be sure that we don't clobber that data 
inadvertently as part of the execution of our algorithm before the information is transmitted, right? So there's kind of no free lunch here. We, we are going to be able to get control back right away, but we still have to deal with this added complexity of making sure that the buffer has actually been transmitted before we overwrite it. Similarly for non-blocking receive, we will start the receive operation and that function, that, that non-blocking receive function will return before the data is received. So if we send, if we start a non-blocking receive, we've got to, we can't immediately go and, and assume that the data is in the buffer, in the receive buffer, as was the case with the blocking receive, because that function just doesn't return back to our program until the data are in the buffer. In this case, the data are not in the buffer necessarily. We've got to verify that it's there before we can actually make use of it. So here's the, um, Here's the two functions, uh, MPI I send and I receive, or the non-blocking versions of send and receive. They're gonna look pretty familiar at this point. We're gonna give a buffer, the location where the, the data start, the number of elements of data that we've got stored there, and then the type. We also send the, or uh, pass in the destination rank and the tag value and the communicator that we're gonna use. We get this additional value now called MPI, or of type MPI request, and this is going to have information in it about the progress of the send in this case. And we'll see how that works in a second. Entirely analogous on the receive side, the buffer, the number of elements, the type of each element, where we're receiving from, what tag we're expecting, the communicator that we're using, and then also an MPI request structure that's going to give us information about the status of the receiving of data from another processor. Okay, so we, we want to make sure at some point before we either overwrite a buffer we're sending or read from a buffer that we're receiving that the operation is complete, that that send or receive is actually finished. So uh, with a non-blocking send, we'd like to be able to reuse that buffer at some point. We got to make sure that the data are all gone from that buffer, that they've all been transmitted to the other, the other side of the connection before we overwrite it. And similarly, on the receive side, we would like to use the data that we've received. We've got, to re we've got to wait until it's all available to us on our process before we can actually do something with it. So how do we do that? Well, turns out there's <coughs> two ways that MPI provides a mechanism for us to do that. So the first is, let me again do the second thing first here. MPI wait is basically going to be a stop and wait operation we pass to it a pointer to one of these request structures. So let's think about, uh, let's think about the receive side. So let's imagine that we've issued an MPI receive and, uh, and we, what we get back here is the value for this request structure. So that's a, a kind of a handle that gives us access to the, the progress information about that receive operation that we've, that we've triggered. And then what we can do with MPI wait is pass to it this, this request object, as well as the address of a status value, and this is the same kind of status value that we saw previously in the uh, MPI send case. Uh, and what this will do is basically wait until this request completes, and then this MPI function, MPI wait, will return to us with the status value set up properly based on the result of that, of that uh, communication operation. So this is the stop and wait case. It's essentially uh, calling um, the MPI, say I receive, followed by MPI wait, is pretty much the moral equivalent of doing an MPI receive. So not something that you use too terribly often. Um, however, the other function here, MPI test, this is a non-blocking check to see if the underlying communication operation has completed. MPI wait will effectively block your process. It'll stop executing until there's some information about the completion of that request, whether it worked or didn't work, and hopefully most of the time it works, but you, it, you're gonna sit and wait inside that function before your code gets more control, or regains control. Here, you're just gonna go out and ask the MPI libraries, hey, has this thing completed or not? Uh, and again, the way we do that is we pass in the, the request object that we got back from MPI I send or I receive. We pass it a flag, a pointer to a flag, and if that flag comes back true, non-zero in C, that means that the operation has been completed. 
And then we also, as, as with the uh, MPI weight, we get a status structure back from this as well to tell us what, um, what, what was the result of that communication. And it's really important to note here that it's uncommon for you to do a non-blocking send or receive and then immediately start doing one of these two things. It's very uncommon to do, immediately try to do a wait. You might as well just use a synchronous receive because it's going to have basically the same behavior. It's going to be useful to you when you have other computation that you can do while that communication is taking place. So maybe you're, you know, you enter some big, some big loop uh, that's kind of the top level control structure of your main computation. And maybe every time through that top level loop, you do a test to see, hey, have I gotten the data that I'm waiting for? And if so, then bring it in and do something with it. And if not, continue to keep calculating, right? So you don't have to immediately turn around and call these functions after you do the asynchronous operation. You're usually not going to do that. All right, let me try to illustrate the behavior of this. Um, so what I'm going to do here is kind of a kind of a broadcast operation. I'm going to do a one-to-many broadcast. I'm not using the bcast MPI call, uh, but instead uh, I want to just sort of show how these um, these asynchronous or um, non-blocking communicators work. So this is a little chunk of my main function. Uh, I'm going to print out my usual hello and goodbye messages as each process comes into existence and goes out. And then uh, if I'm rank zero, I'm going to call this send to many. So rank zero is going to send information out to a bunch of, or to the remaining processors. And if I'm not rank zero, I'm going to call receive from one, and I'm going to pass in ranks and numprocs and stuff as appropriate. So process is going to start, a bunch of processes are going to fire up. Uh, process zero is going to call send to many, send out values to the other processes, and everybody else is going to receive. Okay, um, so here's the send to many function. This will be the thing that process zero is gonna is gonna execute. So it's going to create a random value again, just to illustrate that we really are communicating something that wasn't hardwired into the code. Uh, print out that random value using the debug, and then uh, I've got to define one of these request structures because all of the non or the uh, not yeah non-blocking communication functions require one. So I'm just declaring a local uh, variable with that. And then um, I want to, because I'm process zero, I want to send a value to all the other processes. So I'm going to go, so here's my two rank, the destination I want to send to, and I'm going to go from process one up to one less than the number of processors. Again, I'm process zero, so this is my job to, to do that. I'm going to um, come up with this value that's being sent. I'm going to add to the random value that I generated up here, the process rank that I'm sending to. So again, each process is going to get a random value plus its own rank so we can see that there's variation from process to process. And then here is the MPI uh, non-blocking send, I send. Again, very similar to what we've seen before. We're going to pass in the address of a buffer, basically this long value. There's one thing there and it's a long. We're going to send it to the two rank. I'm using a tag of one in the worldwide communicator. And then what I'm going to get back from this is this MPI request structure called send request and passing an address of that structure so that MPI I send can fill in a value there that will allow me to later rendezvous with MPI and ask, hey, has this been done yet? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this function called await request. Now, inside of here is where I'm going to do the the uh, the waiting to 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 determine when this asynchronous operation completed, and I'm going to pass in my rank and that request structure, and I'm going to also use that on the receive side so we can kind of see how things differ, and then I'm going to say that okay I sent this value to this processor, and then loop around to the next one. So again the 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 point here is that. I could kick off a bunch of transmissions of a value here with this non-blocking send and continue computing while everybody else was waiting around to receive some things. Okay, so that's what process zero is going to do. Now let's look and see what the other ones are going to do. So receive from one, this is going to be run by all the other processes, and they're going to have a receive buffer that's large enough to receive that one long integer message. They're also going to have a request structure that they're going to use to get information from the non-blocking receive. Here's the receive, takes the, the address of the buffer that's going to get the data, one long integer value from process zero, 
using tag one, everybody's participating, and then this is what's going to fill in the receive request variable with the information from that um, from that non-blocking receive. And again, this process is going to also call that await request, give its rank and the handle that it has to the underlying non-blocking communication. And once the uh, once the wait is over, it's gonna come back here and print the value that it got from processor rank zero. Okay, so the only thing we haven't seen so far is this await request function. Again, everybody's gonna call this. Process zero, when it's, a, when it's done, sending and process one when it's done receiving um, or when it's started the non-blocking send and the non-blocking receive would be a better way to think about it. So this guy takes the rank and then that request handle. Uh, well, the way I've defined this is I've encl enclosed it in uh, some, some sharp ifs and end ifs so that in the, in the uh, source code I can turn off this busy waiting or turn it on. Um, so in the, when it's turned on, what will happen is I'm going to have a value for this flag and the status value, and I'm going to call MPI test. Remember that MPI test is just going to basically ask the library, hey, is this communication done? And if whether it is or not, it's going to return right away. Uh, so I, I need to tell it about the, the request itself, right? That's this MPI request thing that's filled in for us when we call MPI I send or MPI I receive. And then we're going to pass the address of that flag. And that's going to be true, non-zero, if the operation has completed. And then we're also going to pass in the address of this status structure that's going to give us the details of the completion of that operation when it completes. So um, what I've done is I've wrapped this whole thing in a do while loop. And so basically uh, I'm going to busy wait that's why I've called this if def busy wait. I'm going to just keep banging on this MPI test function until such time as the flag is true. So while the flag is false, it's just going to loop around, call MPI test, and then um, when it's when that, when that's completed, it's also going to keep track. Or when that's completed, the function is going to exit. It's also keeping track of how many times it actually had to call the MPI test function. So how many times did we spin through this loop while we're waiting for? one of those asynchronous non-blocking communication operations to take place. So I've got a counter up here, I just increment the counter, and then before I return to the caller, I say how many times I tested this. Sorry that there's a lot of kind of setup here to try to, commu to, to, try to get across the ideas underlying these, uh, these communication operations. Okay, so there's two possibilities. This case has no busy wait, okay? Remember that process zero generates a random number and it's trying to send that random number to all the other processors. If I turn off the busy wait, in other words, I define this to be, to be false, then basically this await request function becomes a no-op. It doesn't do anything because none of that code gets compiled in. So let's go back to these uh, underlying functions and sort of think about what's gonna happen. In the send case from processor zero, Processor zero is going to just queue up that that um, that send request. Uh, a wait request is going to do nothing. It's going to print out the debugging message and go back and do the next send. So it's going to set up the sends, the non-blocking sends, just bang, 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 bang. No waiting. On the other hand, in the receive case, so all the processes other than process zero are going to queue up a non-blocking receive, the await request is going to be a no-op, and it's going to say, I got a value, and tell us what value was there in this receive buffer. Okay, so let's look at the output now. Well, here's process three gets going first. We don't have any way of knowing one way or the other who's going to run first and who isn't. So process three says, I'm alive, and then it immediately prints out value. I got value this crazy value. Well, that looks a little fishy. What it's printing out for us here is this receive buffer. But because we teed up the receive, didn't wait for it to complete, and then immediately printed some debugging output, we're getting whatever value just happened to be there in memory. It's just garbage, because we haven't actually verified that it's filled, been filled in with the recept reception of values from process zero. And that's why we get this crazy big number. And then process three goes away. Um, Process zero, 
now we hear we hear from the the sender. It says, "Hey, I'm going to send uh, the ran or I'm going to use the random value 68 when I send these these non-blocking communications to the processor." And if we skip down here for more output from process zero, we see that it sent 68 plus one to process one, plus two to process two, plus three to process three, like we programmed it to do, and then it exits. Well. That's all fine and good, right? The sends were, were doing the right thing, but at the same time that process zero was doing these non-blocking sends, the rest of the processes were all doing non-blocking receives. So process two got a crazy value, process one got a crazy value, and we already saw that process three got a crazy value. So we've, um, we've sped things up, but we've sort of gone overboard with this, right? We're now, we've now uh, sent those requests as quickly as possible and we've done those receipts as quick receives as quickly as possible because we're not doing any kind of blocking that's fast but in this case it's wrong right it's broken now let's turn the busy waiting on and see how this differs so with the busy wait so now that await function is no longer doing nothing it's actually going to call that mpi test function to check to see if the communication has been completed and it's going to spin until the communication is completed. So now we can see here uh, process zero is uh, happens to get out here first. It says that it's generated a random value of 37. So if we scoot down to more output from process zero, we can see that it's sending 38 to process one, 39 to process two, 40 to process three, just like we'd expect, right? It's that random value plus the rank it's sending to. The other process is also got going here, that's fine. Uh, but here's something new, right? We have this output from that await function that says, how many times did I test to see if the underlying asynchronous function or non-blocking function um, had completed or not? Well, process zero, it's, it says here basically it tested one time and then it concludes that it successfully sent that value. So there's nothing that process zero is really waiting for here. Uh, and it turns out that in, the, in this case, all three of these sends resulted in a spin through that loop just once. So as soon as it did the uh, MPI I send, process zero tested to see if it was all sent, and it was. Very small message, very quickly executed, so we're all good. And process zero then exits. Now while process zero was in the was working to send those values out and doing this output and so forth the other pr processes one two and three were waiting to receive something remember that they they uh they all started a non-blocking receive and then they went into this await request function and paused until such time as the uh, the mpi test function came back and gave them a flag value of true at which point they knew that they had actually received that value, that the, the information that was received from process zero was actually in this receive buffer. In other words, it no longer has that garbage in it that it had just from, from whatever happened to be in the stack or the memory for the stack. It's got the actual value that was sent by process zero. So back to the output, we can see here for process one, it tested that test uh, statement, ran that test statement three times, and it got the value 38, which is what the process sent to it. On the other hand, process two was pretty unlucky. It had to actually spin through that loop 311 times, but eventually the value was received and it got the 39 that was sent to it by process zero. And similarly for process three, it had to run through there 213 times, but eventually got the value 40 from process zero. So just by way of summary of these non-blocking communication operations, if you go back to the beginning of the discussion of this topic, we said that you had to be sure that you didn't try to overwrite the contents of a send buffer before the data were sent. You didn't want to read from a receive buffer before the data were actually received. And this is kind of illustrating that behavior. We're seeing that if we don't wait, particularly on the receive side here, the, uh, the value that we're going to have in the buffer is going to be bogus because the receive hasn't completed properly. So again, we can use non-blocking communication to overlap communication and computation, but we then take it on ourselves to have to ensure that the communication has succeeded completely and successfully before we use the data that is in the receive buffers or before we overwrite the values that are in the send buffers to use them for another portion of our algorithm.
Okay, let's look at topologies. Um, MPI supports uh, the notion of mapping a particular topology onto the multi-computer. What we've seen so far is that the, the rank values that come back when we fire up an MPI program are just a sequential index from zero to one less than the number of processes that we fire up. But we can use some MPI capabilities to kind of map those ranks, those processors, to have a specific relationship with one another that can, for example, mimic a grid. So for example, we might have a problem that maps nicely onto a grid of processors that's, for example, a, say a four by two grid, two dimensional grid, where the communication between each process, process might look something like this. Now, there's nothing inherent in the rank value that comes back from our MPI initialization that, as we've been using it so far that would that would give us any indication of a mapping from that just sequence of different processes to something that resembles this kind of a two-dimensional two-dimensional Cartesian grid. But it turns out that the kind of computations that we do typically on a large-scale multi-computer computer are very often going to involve matrix operations or things that map nicely into grids of various dimensions. And we want to look at how MPI supports this ability to create a cool and convenient mapping between the original communicator ranks and a Cartesian coordinate system. It turns out that uh, MPI can support a linear mapping, right? That's what we've been using so far. We're going to look in detail at a Cartesian mapping, a two-dimensional mapping, as I just illustrated. It can also do a mapping that's a general graph. Okay, so the way that we create a Cartesian topology over top of our uh, our multi-computer is MPI CART create. So CART stands for Cartesian. And we can see that there's some parameters here that are going to sort of relate to the previous communicator configuration. Uh, we're going to start with the existing communicator. Remember that we kind of been finessing this notion of a communicator. A communicator is basically just a group of processes that might be all the processes. It might be a subset of the processes. You might have a process that's involved in multiple communicators, but it's basically just a communication domain. What processes can communicate with other processes? And so far, we've just seen a linear domain that includes all the processes, and they communicate with each other by just giving the value of the rank of the process to which they want to send or from which they want to receive. Um, what we're going to do here is lay over the top of that a Cartesian coordinate system. And this, uh, this create function, this cart create function is what does that. So we start with an existing communicator. Um, so we can sort of repartition or reallocate or reassign the locations of the processes in this communicator to now have a Cartesian coordinate system overlaid on them. Uh, there's quite a number of parameters here. Um, so the first one is the number of dimensions. So we're going to do a two-dimensional Cartesian uh, mapping here. So we're going to pass two for that. You can use higher numbers. There's going to be an array of values that's n dims element long that's going to tell us the size of each of the dimensions. So this is going to be, for us, a two-element array the first of which, the first value of which is going to tell us the the dimension along uh, axis zero, and the second along axis one. Then um, periods basically says do the dimensions wrap around. So we uh, we uh, we can think about a Cartesian plane as I've drawn here, but it's also very common and very uh, very helpful to be able to have these things wrap around in one or the other dimension. So instead of just having a leftmost neighbor on one side uh, and, and no rightmost neighbor, we can uh, have these things wrap around so that they're kind of now arranged in a torus where you have neighbors in both directions, left and right. We can also wrap around along the other axis and say now we've got uh, nearest neighbors above and below for every process, even the ones that were formerly kind of on an edge of the, of the Cartesian plane. And that's what the, uh, what the periods array does. It's basically just a true-false value, uh, one for each of the dimensions to say whether it should wrap around. Um, and then the result of this is going to be a new communicator, right? It's a new grouping of, uh, of processes, but now one that instead of reflecting just that linear ordering of rank from 0 to p minus 1, it's going to represent a Cartesian coordinate system that we can use to 
do communication operations and so forth more, more conveniently. Okay, once we've come up with this new communicator, we can ask that communicator for information about how to map from one communicator to another. So we want to be able to, for example, get from, in our, in our case, we're going to create a two-dimensional grid of processors. We'd like to be able to go from the coordinates within that two-dimensional grid to the rank of the processor that is mapped at that location in the grid. And we'd like to be able to go the other direction. So the cart rank is a thing that allows us to take coordinates and turn them into the rank of the processor. And MPI cart coords goes the other direction. It takes a rank and gives us the mapping to the coordinate positions in that Cartesian, Cartesian mapping. Who cares? Why do we want to be able to do this? Remember that all the communication operations that we've seen so far have to do with a specific rank. We can send something, whether we're sending it synchronously or in a non-blocking fashion or doing a broadcast or whatever. The source and destination of communication has always been a rank, a single integer value that uniquely identifies some process that's been allocated in the multi-computer. However, what we're trying to do here with these Cartesian mappings is allow us to write an algorithm that uses the Cartesian coordinate system and then behind the scenes be able to map a particular location in that coordinate or in that Cartesian plane of processes to the underlying rank so that we can use that value to call a communication operation. Okay, so the, the point here is not that we're overlaying a whole new communications mechanism that now takes an X and a Y position instead of just a single rank number. The, the mapping here is just a kind of a convenience that allow us to write an algorithm that, that, that is oriented toward, say, in this case, a two-dimensional plane. And, a, and then when we want to actually do communication, we can go back and turn a particular process into, or, or convert a particular process's coordinates in that plane into the actual rank of that processor so we can call a communication operation. Um, the other aspect of this that's handy in a Cartesian mapping of processes is that we're probably going to have a, pro if we're, so we're going to do some sort of an array operation, uh, that's a two-dimensional array, and we're mapping that onto a two-dimensional grid of processors, we're going to probably want to know about the indices of our neighbors left and right and up and down. And that's what this cart, MPI cart shift does. It takes that communicator that we got back from MPI cart create, right, this guy, and it allows us to say, uh, who are my neighbors depending on two things. The direction I want to communicate, right? Do I want to go to a higher index or a lower index in the Cartesian plane? And then by how much do I want to step? So if I want to just get my nearest neighbor, I only want to go one step. But if I want to get the, near, the neighbor two steps over, then I can supply a step size of two here. And what I get back from this, so these last two parameters are pointers to integers, which is usually a, a, a signal that these are going to be values returned to us from the MPI cart shift function. The, the two values are going to basically be the neighbor on one side and the neighbor on the other side. Let's take a look at an example here. So the first thing we want to do is create the Cartesian communicator. Again, the default communicator is a linear one that has all of the processes in it in just a linear order from zero to P minus one. So MPI cart create is gonna create a Cartesian communicator and it's eventually gonna get stored in the location that we pass to it as its last argument. We've gotta give it some other information. The first here is gonna be the communicator that we already have and we're gonna create a new one based on that. So we're just gonna use MPI com world again. We're going to pass in uh, a, a number two for the, the dimensionality of this plane. So we're creating a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system that's going to that's going to map processors. Uh, the information specifically that we're wanting to map to is determined by this DIMS array. You can see up here, it's just a two-dimensional array, DIMS zero and DIMS one. I've defined these up above here to be four and two. So we're basically just saying two-dimensional array four processors down the zero dimension, two processors across the, uh, the, the one dimension. 
Uh, whether they're periodic, well, here I've just chosen to make the zero dimension periodic, so it'll be the, the down dimension. In other words, I'm going to say these processes are going to wrap along that dimension. But I've chosen to make them not wrap around dimension one, so there won't be any wrap around going on across that dimension. And then that gives us this uh, c communicator. Now, uh, in order to give us some er, some other information here uh, about this mapping, I'm going to call MPI com rank again. Okay, now this is the function that we've been calling inside of our main function, like right away at the beginning after we do an MPI init. But what I want to do is get my ranking within this new communicator. Okay, and it might actually be a different ranking than what I got from the MPI com world. This parameter here that I'm not really paying much attention to is it influences that, but we'll just not worry about it. So uh, what's going to happen here is I'm going to get my rank in this new communicator. I'm going to just use com cart, communicator Cartesian, not MPI com world anymore. And then I'm actually going to determine where I live in this two-dimensional mapping of processes to Cartesian coordinates. So cart chords again allows us to take a rank and map it into coordinates. I know that there's a two-dimensional grid of processes going on here, so I declare this chords array of two integers. And then I call cart chords with that communicator, the rank I just fished out of MPI, and then I gotta say there's two coordinates and there's some place, some uh, some memory to store those in. And what come when, then what I'm gonna do then is just basically print out, well, my coordinates are these things. Let me show you what that output looks like. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit to the output. You can see here, uh, I've got process three, and it's saying my chords are one, one. Process four, my chords are two, zero. Process five, my chords are two, one. Could go through here and kind of dope out which process gets mapped to which coordinate, but I wrote a little function to do that. So here's a function that does that. You can take a look at it in more detail, but it's gonna, under the hood, call this MPI cart rank function that we talked about that allows us to iterate over the different coordinates in the Cartesian mapping, pass them in and get back the rank of the process that's at that coordinate within the com cart co communicator. And here's the output we get. So here's dimension one, I'm sorry, dimension zero, and here's dimension one, and then the particular coordinates for those two dimensions map to these uh, ranks for the processes in that communicator. So they're basically row mapped uh, onto, the, uh, onto the Cartesian plane. Okay, so that's helpful. Now, we also want to be able to figure out who our neighbors are, right? So if I'm a particular processor and I'm responsible for communicate for computing some collection of values in, a, in the resulting array, and I need to be able to interact with my neighbors, I want to know what my, I, I know what my rank is, R, and I want to know what rank I have to communicate with for each of my four neighbors, right above and below me and to the left and to the right. Um, that's what this cart shift function does for me. So I'm going to compute my up rank, down rank, left rank, and right rank. So that would be the thing above me, below me, to my left, and to my right. And I can use cart shift to do those calculations. So again, I'm using the communicator that has this Cartesian mapping. I'm saying I want to look at this along dimension zero, which is the, the vertical dimension. And I want to look at how do I find my neighbor when I skip one process or one element of this Cartesian mapping to, to the side. And it's going to tell me both the, the, the source rank, if, I'm, if, I'm think, if the one says basically I'm thinking of communicating this way. So it thinks of this processor as the source and this processor as the destination. But it amounts to the left rank and the right rank. And in the first case, it's the up rank and the down rank. So what I'm going to get here is the, the ranks of these four neighboring processes so that when I need to, for example, send a bunch of information from, from my process to my neighbor to the left or to the right or receive something from the left or the right or similarly above and below, that I know what those ranks are. Then we can see that in our output. You can see I've, I've printed this information out about up, left, then myself, right, and below. And you get this kind of nice little plus, form, uh, plus formation. In the output, we can see that. So, for example, in 
um, let's just think about uh, process or the process at location two zero, right? Which we know is going to be rank four. You can find that here. Here's rank four. It's yeah, it's at pr location two zero, and we can see that its up neighbor is two, its down neighbor is six, its right neighbor is five, and its left neighbor is negative two. Well, what's going on there? Just go back here to sort of verify that that's what we would expect to see here. Um, it turns out that four's up neighbor is two, its down neighbor is six, its right neighbor is five, as we saw. But remember that when I set up this coordinate mapping, I said I want to have things wrap around this way, but not this way. So in this case, process four does not have a neighbor to the left. And the, the, uh, the value that's returned by MPI to indicate that it's actually a, a defined constant, but it has a value of negative two. So that basically just says, hey, you don't have a left-hand neighbor because you don't wrap around in that direction. If we go back to this picture, though, and think about, say, well, let's look at uh, a process uh, with rank six. It should have an up neighbor of four, a right neighbor of seven, and um, no left neighbor because we're not wrapping around along dimension one, but it should have a below neighbor that actually follows this wraparound back to process zero. And if we find that guy, what did I say, six? Yep. So here's process six. It's at coordinate three, zero, right? Zero, one, two, three, zero. And it has no left neighbor. It has four and seven as its kind of nor normal neighbors, but its, its below neighbor is the wraparound back up to process zero. These Cartesian functions, this topolo set of topology functions, is not an additional mechanism for communication. It's a way for you to conveniently map the underlying multi-computer into a different topology that better suits the problem that you're trying to solve. So again, we're going to do matrix things a lot, or that's, that's typical in supercomputing. Because we're going to do matrix things, it's convenient in many cases to map the processors that are going to be operating on the matrix into a grid formation. And that allows, and this is allowing us to construct that grid and then conveniently map information from the grid where our algorithm lives into the underlying endpoints for communication where we are going to have to, or where we'll then be able to call MPI send and receive and I send and I receive and, and so forth.